As we say goodbye to summer, it's important to put your kids' health at the top of your back to school list. So today, this live conversation is all about back to school health. And we're joined by family medicine physician, Dr. Teresa Berardi, who's coming to us live from Christiana Care Primary Care at Darley Green. She's here to answer all of your questions to help your kids kick off the school year on the right foot. So Dr. Berardi, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for having me, Megan. I'm happy to be here. So before we get started, just a reminder to anyone watching, if you have any questions, shoot those questions in the chat of this Facebook Live, and we'll be able to add those questions in to our conversation. So Dr. Brady, we'll start with general wellness. How important is it for students to see their primary care physician at the start of the school year? So it's definitely important for kids to see their physicians at least once a year. They don't necessarily have to see them before the school year starts, although there is very often paperwork that is required from you know, daycares to elementary schools all the way through middle school, high school, and college. Um, and so very often we do see um, kids and teens and young adults during the summer or at the beginning of the school year. Uh, but uh, as long as uh, as long as students are seeing their doctors uh, once a year, that is um, that's kind of like the more important point. And a lot of students are seeing their primary care physician because of sports physicals and making sure they have all that paperwork signed to play football or field hockey or whatever the case may be. Is there a difference between a sports physical and then just a yearly physical? So very often, um, pediatricians or family doctors, both of whom see kids, um, will do both at the same time, just because most kids hopefully are engaged in sports. Um, and so a sports physical um, is a little bit different than a regular physical, although once again, they're done at the same time. A sports physical place, uh, basically places special attention in regards to the musculoskeletal system, the cardiovascular system, so the heart and lungs, um, and looks specifically also at family history um, and the patient's medical history in regards to things that may affect their ability to play a sport. So for example, if a kid has asthma, um, we want to make sure that asthma is well controlled uh, before they play that sport. Um, there also is uh, specific paperwork that has to be filled out, as I had mentioned before. Definitely a reminder if your kids are playing sports to submit that paperwork now. I know that many schools in the area, especially in Delaware, have started already, but um, a lot of schools in Pennsylvania haven't yet started. And I know that we serve that community. So definitely drop the paperwork off because it just it sometimes takes a while to get it back. Absolutely. And we know vaccinations are also a big part of that yearly appointment. So talk about the vaccinations that kids definitely need before kindergarten. So, um, you know, vaccines um, are a huge part of what we do within primary care. Um, it's something that I'm very passionate about and something that I spend a lot of time talking about, excuse me, <clears throat> not only um, in the advent um, of the COVID vaccine, but also um, there are lots of other vaccines that have existed for decades that very often um, we spend time talking about during the visit. Um, the, the requirements uh, vary by state. Um, obviously, since Christiana Care is in Delaware, um, most of our patients are within Delaware, but we also serve patients in Pennsylvania, in New Jersey, in Maryland. And so generally speaking, the vaccines that are required um, are the four, basically four-year-old vaccines, um, which are DTaP, so diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis, which is whooping cough, polio, and then measles, mumps, and rubella, and varicella, in addition to lots of other vaccines that are required uh, in infancy. Um, and then <clears throat> there is also, there's a ton of information on the Centers for Disease Control website, specifically geared towards parents. And there's a very um, kind of patient and parent friendly vaccine schedule that's different from the clinical one that physicians use that very often I will give to parents that are in my office. And we will put a link to that chart in the comments below as well so that parents right. can easily just click on that and see that. But the next time you really need to go run through that list of vaccines from a school perspective is going to college. So what are the recommended vaccines for those who are you know, moving into UD? Yes. Um, so very often the vaccines that are required for college are vaccines that are given much earlier, starting at age 11. And so the ones that usually are required to live in a dorm are Tdap, 
so tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis once again, once again, which is whooping cough, and then meningitis. And so there are different types of meningitis vaccines that we give to to kids who are 11 and older, and then once again at 16 and older. Um, the, the first ones that we give generally are, um, the brand name is called Minactra, and it covers three different types of strains, so A, C, and Y. Um, and that booster, which very, very often can be missed because a lot of teenagers, a third of all teenagers don't go to the doctor every year. And so very often that 16 year old booster for that Minactra is missed. And then in addition to that, um, there's men B. So there's another serotype that we give vaccines for, um, for meningitis. And so there are other vaccines um, that we often will give within this age group, things like HPV or human papillomavirus, obviously COVID vaccines, which I very um, strongly advocate for in patients, um, and then the yearly, flu shot, the yearly flu shot as well. So as you mentioned, COVID and flu, incredibly important, not required to go to school, but certainly will help keep your child healthy and attending school. So what is your message to those who are maybe hesitant about getting their child vaccinated for COVID or flu this year? My message is very direct to patients. Um, my message is to get it. You know, it, it, they both are incredibly safe vaccines. The COVID vaccine, for example, um, has been given to 12 billion doses, <clears throat> excuse me, um, have been given throughout the world. Um, and <clears throat> they're incredibly safe. Um, flu vaccines, as we know, have been around for decades. Once again, incredibly safe, should be given twice the first year that, um, that babies receive vaccines. And then once a year after that, we typically will recommend that um, adults and kids get the flu vaccine in the fall, usually in September or October, but anytime through the flu season. Um, but yeah, my, my message normally is get the flu vaccine, get the COVID vaccines, um, and we can start giving the COVID vaccines as young as six months. Um, I very often have this conversation in the office um, when babies are in the office and they come in for their more frequent visits when they're younger at the six month visit, <clears throat> there's a whole host of other standard vaccines that we give. Um, I'm, I'm, Quite honestly, <clears throat> I'm surprised sometimes when um, when parents don't know that we can give flu vac. I mean, that when we can get, we typically will give flu vaccines starting at six months, but also we can give the COVID shot starting at six months. And so, you know, not only do those two vaccines specifically protect um, your child from not getting those, but they also help to you know, decrease visits uh, and co-pays to doctors, uh, you know, to emergency rooms, to doctor's offices, to urgent care centers. Um, and they also help just to keep the community safe, to keep the most vulnerable in our community from getting these things. Absolutely. So let's transition a little bit from health into more of that lifestyle wellness. You know, that transition from the summer schedule to a school set schedule can be difficult for everyone, parents included. What is your advice for making sure the sleep schedules kind of get back on that early morning, get on the bus schedule? So yes, Megan, I will say that um, a lot of mom friends um, and myself will talk about how the how the end of the summer is a really difficult time, not only for the kids, but definitely for us, just because the summer is a very, you know, typically much more unstructured environment at home and at work. Um, and kind of transitioning to that more, usually more rigorous schedule where kids have uh, an earlier bedtime um, and they don't not want to necessarily go to bed can be really challenging. I mean, it's certainly a challenge in my house. Um, I have a kid in elementary school and a kid in middle school, um, and they have been talking for the past week or two about not wanting to go to sleep earlier. So, you know, there's a few things that we can certainly talk about in regards to helping with that transition. Once again, not perfect, not always easy. Um, and I know also that a lot of schools have already started, but sometimes I'll talk to parents about setting, um, you know, starting that transition a little bit earlier in the summer, because sometimes it can take weeks or longer to kind of get that earlier to sleep, earlier to rise schedule up and going. Um, I mean, 
it's it's okay if you haven't started it yet. Um, other things that I very often will talk to parents about are things like just general sleep hygiene. And so sleep hygiene um, is basically things, non-medicine, non-medical approaches to going to sleep. Um, and I spend a lot of time talking to parents um, you know, talking to the adult patients that I have specifically about sleep issues and also for kids. And a lot of the same kind of ideas apply to both. And so, you know, generally speaking, kind of setting, um, keeping a consistent schedule in regards to even on the weekends, which can be really hard, I think, for adults and for kids, but trying to go to bed around the same time and waking up somewhere around the same time. Um, another uh, big thing to address, not surprisingly, is screens, just because um, screens emit certain wavelengths of light once they hit the retina or the back of the eyes can be very stimulating. So um, certainly avoiding screens for at least a half an hour or an hour before bed is really important. Um, another thing is avoiding caffeinated drinks. And so, you know, caffeine is uh, because of the beverage industry. Um, it's in a lot of things. It's not just in coffee and tea. It's in tons of things that kids drink, such as you know, such as soda and, you know, tons of other things. Um, the amount, you know, even in, even in things like chocolate. And so avoiding high levels of caffeine are also super important. Um, other things in sleep hygiene that are important are keeping the bedroom a little bit cooler than the rest of the house, because that can help to facilitate sleep. Um, and then keeping the bedroom also a little, keeping it very dark can also help to facilitate sleep. So once you get up in the morning, first thing a lot of people do is eat breakfast. How important is it that kids are sitting down and having an actual, you know, good breakfast and not just running on the bus with, you know, a frozen waffle in their hand? Yes. Um, yeah, I will say that our my family struggles a little bit with this one, just because I tend to start hours really early in the morning and my husband is home with the kids and sometimes they're just they're running late and it's hard to kind of get things up and going. Um, it's not a perfect system in my house and it probably isn't in a lot of other houses. Um, I sometimes will try on the weekends to cook things that um, that I know that are are more nutritious than like a pop tart that'll have like, you know, protein and veggies or fruits and carbs. So sometimes on the weekends, I will make like different types of like banana breads with spinach or which with, you know, with varying levels of success with the kids. So, um, you know, making sure that they have adequate amount, once again, of like a proteins, carbs, fruits, vegetables, things like that. Um, another thing um, in regards to just nutrition is um, school lunches for a lot of districts are changing this year just because of COVID relief packages in many, many places throughout the country. And I think in most schools throughout the country, school lunches were free for the past couple of years. And a lot of that COVID relief funding is ending. And so uh, this year, uh, at the beginning of this school year, I think a lot of parents and kids uh, are going to be packing more lunches if their kids, um, or if, you know, if the kids don't want, or if the parents don't want the kids to have school lunches, um, which I think is actually kind of a good idea. I mean, school lunches, um, I think most Americans know that school lunches um, leave a lot to be desired. They're not always super, super healthy. Um, but I think that, you know, supplying your kids with things that don't have a ton of sugar, I think really just helps to set them up for success in school. Just because when kids have sugar, as we all know, there is this really quick kind of energy peak that comes after giving sugar. And then once that kind of sugar high wears off, they can be kind of sluggish. Um, and then the other thing is in regards to um, nutrition, I mean, I'm really passionate about nutrition as most primary care doctors are, and we spend a lot of time in the office talking to parents, talking to um, adults in practice um, in regards to, you know, how, you know, what should I eat? How, you know, what do I buy when I go food shopping? Um, how do I cook all these things that I have? Um, and how do I make it into nutritious kind of timely meals? Um, one thing that I almost always will tell parents is that it doesn't need to be perfect. You know, um, a, a friend of mine in residency had shared, I think on social media many, many years ago, when both of our kids were toddlers, um, something that I've used from time to time. Um, and there, we basically at our house uh, call it muffin tin dinners. And, and it's basically a muffin tin that we use. I might be part of this before, Megan. And it's basically whatever leftovers we have. And it can we just put in different sections of muffin tins and it's a great way for us to get proteins, carbs, 
um, and all sorts of like fruits and veggies in there. So that's kind of an easier one to do. Um, you know, it really helps to set kids up for lifelong success, not just school success um, when they are, when they're involved um, in regards to things that they're eating and things that they're cooking. And so once again, it doesn't need to be perfect, but um, getting kids involved in regards to food shopping and cooking and all of those things helps for them to feel like they're a part of the process. That muffin tin dinner idea is fabulous. Thank you for sharing that. Super Hopefully easy. Mothers yeah. are also taking notes here as you share these tips. Yeah. Um, you know, let's move a little bit to the to the mental health as well. We all know anyone who's been in school, especially in those, you know, middle school years, school can be stressful for a multitude of reasons. And so how do parents make sure that they're really connecting with their kids and not just worrying about, you know, did you did you eat the right thing? Are you doing all your homework? But also checking in with them on that emotional level. Yes. And so, you know, the, the COVID pandemic has certainly brought mental health issues into the forefront of things that we're talking about in regards to our students. And so um, I, not surprisingly, spend a lot of time talking to parents and adults about mental health issues. Um, I'll start by saying that it's important to set up, to set an environment at home where you're normalizing things that don't go well. It's important to talk to your kids um, about things that are not going well in your own life. So, you know, when you come home and you've had a really busy, maybe stressful day at work, um, it's important to model the behavior where you're coming home from work and you're talking about things that have gone well, successes, and things that haven't gone well, failures. Um, and you, um, you know, are talking about things that have, you know, things that could go better for the next day. So, once, so normalizing it, I think, is a good place to start. Um, and, you know, very often, um, especially with kids as they're getting older, you know, the teens are notorious for not always wanting to share details about things that are going on, you know, stereotypically, not always. Um, but I think that starting from a young age in regards to getting into routines where you are talking about things that are going well and not going well, is really important. Um, one thing that we will do in our house that I also will recommend to patients' families is we do an exercise, not every day, but you know, maybe a few days a week um, over dinner. Um, we'll do something called high-low buffalo um, which is basically you're talking about something that good that that went well that day, some of that didn't go well, and then the buffalo is something that's kind of unexpected, funny, strange. And so, you know, as opposed to asking your kid how did school go, fine. It hope it helps uh, sometimes to kind of open up uh, open up conversations, especially about things that don't don't go well. Um, you know, eating dinner together, um, which isn't always doable just because most American kids are super busy with tons of activities and sports, but trying to make an effort to have dinner um, at least a few days a week is super important um, just because studies have shown that kids and families that eat together um, basically have, um, there are positive kind of, um, there are positive attributes or positive things that come from that. And so I'm just looking down at my notes. Um, there was a study that was done through Columbia University that showed that families that eat together at least a few days a week um, have uh, kids that um, with lower incidence of being overweight, um, kids that eat generally healthier foods, um, uh, they have decreased risky behavior, especially as they go into the teen years in regards to drug use um, and early sexual activity. Um, and they generally have better relationships with, um, with their kids. So um, that's something that I would recommend. Um, you know, obviously most families want to have dinner together, but um, you know, there's always logistics that come into play in regards to schedules and cooking things and um, you know, try your best. We generally just try our best in our house too. So some key takeaways, uh, high low buffalo, muffin tin dinners, trying your best because certainly <laughs> everyone struggles, every everyone, you know, deserves a little give normalizing a little it. Grace, yes, through all of this craziness of back to school season. So, you know, before I let you go, what other key takeaways do you want to make sure people understand today? Um, I definitely want to stress that your child's pediatrician or family doctor is your biggest advocate in regards to physical health and mental health. Certainly bring your kids to see their doctors uh, at least once a year, just for general, not problem-based physicals. 
um, and certainly bring questions, bring concerns, um, talk to them about the websites that you're reading, uh, that you're using, which may or may not have correct information on there. Talk to them about the conversations that you're having with coworkers and with friends, um, especially not only about COVID stuff, but about all like physical health, mental health stuff. Um, and um, the, the final thing that I wanna say is that good physical health and mental health basically um, sets kids up for, for academic success during the school year. Dr. Barty, thank you so much for all of the information today. Hopefully everyone watching really will take home those takeaways as they manage the next few weeks and getting those kids up and out the door. And if you're watching and have any other questions, especially after this live ends, shoot them in the chat and we'll be able to uh, chat with you there and answer your questions. And we also have links to CDC articles and Christiana Care Primary Care resources in the chat as well. Thank you all so much and good luck in the school year.